All right. Uh, welcome, everybody. And it looks like we're a relatively small group right now. So I'm going to ask people if they would like to make everybody move up to the front, perhaps, so that we can, you know, be a little bit cozier. If you're comfortable, if you're comfortable. Um, so. so while everybody's moving, I just want to introduce our next speaker who's going to talk about creating lifetime donors. Um, and our speaker is Pam Swank. Uh, I will read a little bit of her bio, but I have known Pam for probably 20 years, and uh, she is one of the best fundraisers that I have ever met in my entire life, and very much focuses on the individual and the relationship and the cultivation and stewardship and how important that is as part of our Making Lifetime Donors. Um, so she's been a nonprofit for more than 30 years, um, mostly at voluntary health organizations like Children's Tumor Foundation, including Alzheimer's, Easter Seals, National Multiple Sclerosis Society, Juvenile Diabetes, Leukemia and Lymphoma Society, um, which is where I know her. Others in the room know her from other organizations. But um, every time she speaks, I know I listen. So I'm looking forward to learning from her today. And uh, with no further ado, I'm going to ask her to come up and, and share her words of wisdom with us. I'm a little um, unsure how wise I am today, but I will do my level best. I just wanted to thank you so much for um, inviting me to join you today. Um, it has just been such an honor and a privilege. And one of the best things that I get to do and I've gotten to do for the past 30 years is work with volunteers. Um, you guys are the ones that make everything happen. You are the you, you are the the crux of the organization, you're the bones, and you're also the inspiration. And so I just want to thank you for having me be here today. You know, it's, um, it's, your, it's your hard work, your, your blood, your tears that allow our organizations to do things like defeat MF. And I know we're not there now, but we're going to be because of the work that you do. And so I want to give you a, a round of applause for everything that you do. And i um, so glad that I can help you think of some ways that we can work with, um, with donors so that they're not feeling like ATM machines, right? Nobody wants to feel like an ATM machine. Could you change the slides, please? Always gotta start with a story. I have heard that so many times today. Always gotta start with a story because that's how we bring people in. Sorry, I don't have an NF story. But um, I have a different one, and it's, a, it's one of the reasons that I was involved with um, Leukemia Lymphoma for Society for a long time. Life isn't about waiting for the storm to pass, it's about le learning to dance in the rain. The first time I ever heard that quote was from a volunteer by the name of Bob Piercy. He was somebody that I knew very well from the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society. He was a patient. He was suffering with non-Hodgkin's for a very long time. He had the most positive outlook he had the most positive way of, 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 of seeing things and of viewing things. And he gave that positivity to everyone around him. He made everybody feel very good and very special about what they did. I used to take him to dinner. I used to take him to the theater. We used to just have a good time. He couldn't get out very easily. He couldn't mobilize himself very easily. But it was always such a pleasure to be out with him. And um, he was just, he, he just won you over. He completely won you over. He lived in Lakeshore Drive in, in Chicago. If you're not from the area, his home was in Joliet, which is a bit of a travel. Um, it's not something that you could really do every day. Bob was single, um, and he was also very dependent upon being in this area, in the downtown area, to get his treatments. And so that was really important to him. His family wanted him to go home. His family wanted him really badly to move back home so they could take care of him in Joliet. And he didn't want that. He wanted to be with his friends. He wanted to be near his work. He wanted to maintain as much independence as possible. Um, so he did make a, de a decision to stay. However, as his disease progressed, there was a group of about 12 of us, including Maria in the back, um, who would be his caregiving team. And my role was to go there on weekday mornings before work, get him up, get him cleaned up, get his breakfast, help him take a walk around his apartment, floor, the floor that his apartment was on, 
and then get his um, get him on FaceTime with his parents. And then I would go off and then the next person would come in. We did this for about three months until he lost his battle. There was a there were 12 of us who were there with him all the time. At the funeral, we all continued what his belief was. Life isn't about waiting for the storm to pass. It's about learning to dance in the rain. Bob made a permanent impact on me, on my life, and on all of those who knew him. I will tell you honestly to this day, whenever I get a Facebook thing that says it's his birthday, I go in and say happy birthday. And other people do too. That's the kind of impact that he had. And, and it was that kind of impact that he felt so strongly about the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society that he was willing to do anything he could possibly. And when you have that kind of person who will do those kinds of things for you, who is in a state of really poor health, it's incredibly, incredibly inspirational, humbling, and it really makes you understand what you need to do. So that's Bob Piercy, and I will tell you, Bob's team, we miss him every day. So why am I saying this? Next slide, please. You need to tell the story that's been growing in your heart. Be the characters you can't keep out of your head. The tale that speaks to you, that pops into your head during your daily commute, that wakes you up in the morning. That's what storytelling is. It's something that's coming from your heart. It's something that you feel. Storytelling does not have to be your story. Storytelling can be telling a story that you relate to, an authentic and genuine story that you relate to. And that's how we get people, goodness sakes, I'm just doing this. That, that's how we get people involved in our causes and what we do. It's through our stories. And um, it can't be just always, you know, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me. That's not how it works. You have, to, you have to have that relationship. We've talked about, I've heard relationship and storytelling so many times today, I wish it was a drinking game. Um, because that's, it's, that's what it should, it shouldn't be a drinking game, no, but it should be those two things. It should be relationships and it should be storytelling. So if we could go to the next slide, please. So how do we, how do we, how do we acquire donors? How do we bring people to us? We're gonna start with constituents, okay? So sometimes people who are involved with us, they may not be donors but they're still associated with us. So they are constituents. And we wanna be able to start with them. We always wanna be inclusive as to who we um, invite into the Children's Tumor Foundation family. We wanna open it to everybody, allow everybody to be a part of it. We want to grow your relationship first. Starting off with an ask, we'll put some off. So grow the relationship first. Always communicate about the mission. Again, that's something else that I think people have a hard time with. They get so focused on, okay, I gotta get money, I gotta get money, I gotta raise money, I gotta raise money. And it's just like, you have to tell the story and the story is about the mission. And we always need to keep those things in mind because it is the most important part of what we need to do. When somebody becomes a donor, we need to get to know why. Why are they giving to us? There, there's a myriad of reasons, but until we really understand what they're, why they're supporting us and what they're doing, we're not gonna get to, to that real authentic relationship with them. So get to know your donor. You wanna segment your donors too. Segment is such a, such a term, you know, right? So what that really means is if you have um, a particular set of donors for, for your walk, and they are donors, by the way. If you have a specific set of donors for your walk, what motivates them? And can you put them into buckets? So maybe you have a bucket that it's, it's the research, and maybe you have another bucket that it's a community that they need to, to, to deal with NF. Maybe there's a bucket that says they just want to be a part of an organization and be a part to eventually maybe be a leader in an organization. So when, you, when you're talking to them, make sure that you know where they fit and where they sit and what they want, because that's how the, you're going to make a difference with them. If they really believe that you know who they are, it's going to make a difference. I was just talking to um, Sharon, Sharon Klein, um, and it's an old NPR story, but it's still relevant. Um, I give to NPR, public television, the whole thing. Um, and I, I do it. We live in Michigan, but I do support the Chicago PBS. I give to them. Let's be clear. It is me. 
it is not my husband who gets every single letter asking him to give. My husband doesn't give. <laughs> it's me. And you know what? That's an indication you don't know me. You're not paying attention to me. And I have pulled out of it before, and I will pull out of it again. So make sure that you invest the time. That's how you're going to grow it, and that's what's going to happen with it. Invest the time. Set more than financial goals. That's, I think we spend a lot of time on financial goals. But how many donors, how many donors do, do we want? How many walkers do we want? How many people do we want to have? How many teams do we want? Set those kinds of goals, too, because sometimes, first of all, when you set a financial goal and that's your only goal and you don't make it, you feel like crud, right? Well, it could be that you set a financial goal and you didn't make it because you had a hurricane come through or you had this come through. So have other measurements. So it's not just monetary. Monetary is very important. That's how we cure, that's how we cure disease, right? It's through research, which comes in from money. But if all of these, the only goals you're setting are, is a monetary, you're missing a lot of other things. I don't know about you, I am not this. Be a social media star. It is really, really changing things, hum hugely changing things. And, and sometimes people just think, oh yeah, I'm doing it on Facebook. Well, there's a lot of different platforms and there's a lot of different ways to get it out there. And, and you really need to, um, to, to be sure that you're trying to be a, a star in that area. And I think as I heard in a, in a session earlier, not only be a star in that area, but ask, please share this. Please share this post. Please get this out to other people so that we can continue to grow our constituent base that will eventually, many will become donors. Always, always, always let the donor know the impact that they're making. You know, if it's, if it's a matter that, you know, it's a, if it's a $50 gift, what does that $50 do? What does that $100 do? What does the $25 do? Always let them know. And then when your event is over or when you're done working with your, with your donor or your, your campaign is over, give a wrap up to them. Let them know what's been accomplished. Let them know what that translates into for Children's, Children's Tumor Foundation. That's, that part's really important. Create small donor engagement events. I think that that's something that we had talked about, sort of. Take it to the social level. Go out, go have a fun evening and don't ask for money. Have a nice evening and bring in a, a researcher or bring in somebody who can talk to this, to NF, but don't charge them. Get them thinking and talking in different ways. Not every contact with a donor should be asking for things. You also have, um, within your organization, you've got the face-to-face um, -face setting, such as cocktails for a cure or dinner for friends, dinner with friends. Um, and apparently you, you all run in your underwear as well. That is not something I will be doing, by the way. <laughs> Nobody needs to see that. But it sounds fun. Can I get the next slide, please? So how do we prevent donor fatigue? So again, we want to identify significant donors and create messaging that is tailored to them. Not everybody should get every message. It needs to be tailored to them. And so part of the reason is you don't, you, you, you might not want somebody who is giving you um, $250. You might not want to send them and ask for 25 because that other 225 is going to be left on the table. So just make sure that you're, that you're um, messaging the right people to write things to the right people. Attitude of gratitude, so important. So important to have an attitude of gratitude. Um, people need to feel that they are special and that they're important. And sometimes we don't do that. And then when it happens a few times, they're gonna go away. They're just gonna go away. Again, don't ask every donor to participate in every campaign. Some things just aren't right. So um, I will support somebody that asks me that's a friend and they're doing something that they care about. There's no way I'm running a marathon. Don't even ask me to do that. This is not gonna happen. So again, just make sure that you're asking people the right things, which it gets to the key part of knowing who you're talking to. Invite, to, invite your top donors to exclusive information events. Let them feel that they're really special. Let them get access to things that maybe other people haven't had access to. That's going to help them feel positive. It's going to help them feel refreshed. It's going to help them feel all those things. Keep good records. 
just keep good records. There's nothing else to say. Keep good records. Um, it's just, again, super important. That's how we know how people are. Encourage your donors and your constituents to bring other people. Come on, this is, this is going to be fun. Bring everybody with you. Bring everybody with you. And so that way, maybe you're going to be able to get some additional people that are going to join the cause and, and be a part of it. Keep a fresh outlook on things and make, maintain your relevance. I have been at very large voluntary health organizations. And I will tell you that nearly all of them, at one time or another, fell out of being relevant and had to go through and had to do a, a whole another shakeup and had to say, okay, what are we really doing? Does the message from four years ago still work? Is, are the things that we're saying now still important? Because if you, if you have a donor that's coming in to any of every event and they're hearing the same message over and over and over, it's gonna feel like they're not making, we're not making any changes, we're not moving forward, we're not doing things to really make a difference. And so it's just really important that we're relevant. And again, share the difference that their support is making and recognize them in a meaningful way. So what's meaningful for me may not be meaningful for you. And it's, it's a matter of discovering what, what is it that's important. And when I say make it special for them, I'm not saying that every single donor gets everything different, but there are some donors that, you know, there are some donors that like phone calls. There are some donors who like emails. There are some who like texts. Um, there's just different ways to communicate and to express things and just make sure that you're trying to do that for the donor as best as you can. So what I'm going to ask you to do is um, I'm going to ask you within your tables. You can go to the, yeah, that's it. Thank you. Um, I'm going to ask you, it says four. I don't care how many you do. I'm not going to be that directive. You can do 15. But I would like for you guys to talk for the next few minutes about what is your personal story? Well, how is it? How do you tell it? For some people, it may be your personal story is, is, about, is about yourself or about a child. For some of you, you may not feel comfortable talking about that element. That's okay. But there are things you can pull out of CTF that can still create a wonderful, fabulous story. So I'm going to give you like 10 minutes. I want everybody to, to get involved in this. And then we're going to have people talk about their stories um, as a group. Does that sound good? Okay, go.
We've got about one minute left, and then we're going to start having you guys tell your stories, okay? Now? No. Okay, so who wants, who wants to start tell, talking about their stories? Who wants, who's, who's our first volunteer? Sure. Got it? Uh, why not? Like the mayor. Um, if you want to, sure. <laughs> I can help you out, ma'am. I'll carry it around when you're done. Thank, thank you, Amy. Um, well, for those who may not know me, I'm Ken Linkus. Uh, started with CTF about 10 years ago. Jumped ship to Cupid's. Uh, been a race director in Jacksonville ever since, and, uh, and now we're back in the fold, and it's great to be back, and I just love seeing all the people I haven't seen in years again. It's been great. So 
Um, most, well, some of you may have heard our story. Uh, Lori and I, we share the story. My wife, Lori, who's the Walt coordinator in Jacksonville, took over for me when I, when I left. Um, we got involved because our son, Connor, has NF1. He was diagnosed at the age of one. Um, he uh, went through chemo when he was two for three optic gliomas. Um, his third birthday was his last day of treatment. Um, what was great about that is he is too, he was too young to recall any of that. Kids are resilient, it tears us up, but they bounce back in great ways. Um, Connor had all of the, uh, you know, he has the cafe au lait, the, the freckling, um, the tumors are dormant, all right? Uh, he uh, had his learning disabilities in, in grade school. And uh, Lori and I have, you know, we kind of joke about, we feel like we graduated high school a second time, not because we did the work for him, but it was helping him to understand and comprehend, you know, the subjects. Then Connor goes and, once he graduates high school, he goes and surprises us in college, gets a degree in graphic design and, uh, and uh, what design, and digital media and graphic design um, from uh, one of the local schools down in Jacksonville. And he was on the Dean's list because the one thing we've, we've learned is children with NF, when they find something that they absolutely love, they focus on that and give it all their attention. And we saw that in him, it's just amazing. Connor's 26 now, he's holding down two jobs, still living at home, but we're not in any hurry to get rid of him. <laughs> um, and we're gonna continue the fight because the, we have real hope, you know, selumetineb, you know, right there, we shared that with, you know, at Cupid's, I shared that with the, uh, the runners there and saying, look, you guys, you always hear about causes and everything like that. And there are some tremendous causes out there and there's great work being done. We have something to show you here. What you're doing is real. At the walks, we do the same thing. You know, we're interchangeable, you know, because I support her in the walk, of course, and she supports me with Cupid. She doesn't run in her underwear either, <laughs> all right? Uh, it's very easy, and yes, I am wearing a pair of Cupid's undies right now, but I'm not going to drop. Um, so, but yeah, I know, I know. I'm not, I'm not, I don't, I don't think I need to, you know, you know, uh, what am I trying to advertise? So I'm not going to do that. But anyway, but that's our story. That's how we got involved. And I just love the fact so much that everybody's here. We get a chance to see each other once again. And this is the first time I've gotten through one of these without cracking up, you know, just, you know, tearing up. So anyway, love you guys, love you for everything that, that we do together. All right, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. That's, you know, that, who, who can't be moved by that story? You know, you find out, you find out early that, that your child has, has a problem or a disability or whatever you find out, but then through a lot of work and effort, um, and with an organization, partnering with an organization like this, two jobs. I have a 32-year-old who barely has one. Um, so, I mean, I, it, it's a really inspirational story. So, thank you. Thank you so much. Who wants to volunteer next? I'll fight you for that mayor position later, but we can take votes and all that stuff. It's fine. Um, I'm Carol Ann OMB, and my son Robert is will be 13 in 10 days, and he has NF1. Um, he was diagnosed at two and a half, um, spent about 18 months trying to figure out what in the world was going on with our child, and um, had lots of complications for a while. But at um, the age of eight, we discovered that he was going to have to have neurosurgery to um, debulk the tumor, and he no longer had um, any bone separating his orbit and his eye. Um, we spent nine hours in sheer agony, worrying that our son would not wake up from the surgery, and if he did, that things would not be the same. Um, it was a wonderful success, and then fast forward nine months later, and he was sitting at his desk at school, and um, because of such a wonderful, wonderful teacher, he is here today to be with us. Um, he started um, coloring in a rhythmic pattern, and she asked him to go get his lunchbox, and he did not, and she knew that 
he was such a rule follower that something must be awry. And um, moments later, when she sent the rest of the children to the lunchroom, down concrete steps that he would have also been on, <laughs> um, he fell out of his desk and be began to seize and had a 90 minute seizure. Um, as most of you know, um, seizures are supposed to last 90 seconds or less. Roberts was 90 minutes. He woke up, did not recognize anyone but me, and we thought that was gonna be the same forever. And by the grace of God, he remembers everyone in his life, and he is the most athletic, most stubborn, <laughs> wonderful, sometimes mean-spirited to his big sister who loves him beyond belief, um, but amazing kid who is here, and it's because of this organization that I don't live in fear all the time, and because of friends like this one that continue to fight this fight with us. Um, I would say she's unaffected, but she's very affected. Her son and my son are best friends. So um, it's um, a journey that none of us want to share, but I am grateful for all the faces and the names and the people in this room that I have gotten to know because of the fight that we continue to fight together. We could do one more short one, if anybody wants to raise their hand. Hi, I have NF1 inherited from my mother. Uh, she knew when I was around three months old, just because of some of the classic identifiers. I don't think, if I'm remembering correctly, I didn't receive an official diagnosis until I was around three. Um, there isn't actually, I'm from Canada, um, and there's not actually a whole lot of NF things. I don't have a clinic. I don't have a doctor that knows about NF. I don't have any of that. Um, so it's been interesting. Um, I had two spinal surgeries. And during my time in hospital, I became fascinated with the concept of child life specialists and the, the profession. And I'm now uh, in my Master of Science to become a child life specialist. Um, so yeah, that's a short one for you. Good job. That's a great one. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. If, if we could change sides, please. Um, I am going to be quick. One thing I left out, Connor is a fourth degree black belt in Tang Soo Do. Oh All right. He has worked his tail off. So anyway, I just needed to share that. Yay. If we could switch slides, please. I think you heard this. So what are the elements of a good story? They're simple. They're not really complex. We're talking in a language that everybody understands. And we're talking to our audience in a way that they can hear us and understand us as well. Um, emotional. I, each one of you got emotional. Each one of you got emotional. And, and it's hard to do, by the way. It's, 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 it, it feels very, you feel very fragile when, you, when those emotions bubble up. Um, but don't be ashamed of it and don't be afraid of it because it's real and it's genuine and it's what's going to bring people in truthful you gotta be truthful I, I again from the three of you i heard nothing but truth i hope you heard the same for me when i was talking about bob it's it's just based in your soul it's it, it's what it's what's real and people can tell when you're when they're, you're speaking the truth they can hear it they can see it they can feel it it needs to be real preferably based on your own story if possible but I demonstrated how that wasn't my story. It's possible for it not to be your story. And especially in some cases where it's very difficult to talk about when it's your own family, your own child. And we, 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 we can stare away from that kind of stuff. And, and I understand why completely. Um, so find it about somebody else that, it, that, that you can relate to. I'm quite sure that there are, that you all have other NF families in your, in your circle. If you need to, if you need to use one of these stories to help convey that because it's not in you yet to tell yours, it's okay. But you need to have the story. And then it valid. A good story, a good story works for anybody regardless of what it is. A good story works for everybody regardless of what it is, as long as it has these other elements. So we already shared the stories. So let's um, go to two slides. 
the last one. Yeah, thank you. So once you have your story, your acquisition plans, your retention plans, what can still get in the way? Or as I wrote, what can still get gets in the way? Um, so apologize for that. Um, first thing that you need to start with is you need to start with making a gift yourself. I can't say that more frequently or more often because you, you, need to, you need to show that you've got, some, you've got some skin in the game. And a stretch gift is different for everybody. A stretch gift could be, for you, it could be $25, $50. For you, it could be $250, it could be 1000 Whatever that stretch gives, gift is for you, make it for you. Fake it till you make it. Just keep trying it. Just keep working at it. You'll get there. You'll get there. And the more you do it, the more confidence you're going to have. And it's going to feel better. What is your agenda? What is your agenda? Your agenda is to cure NF. That is an incredibly, incredibly important agenda. You don't have any other agenda. You're not trying to, you're not trying to shake anybody down. You're trying to cure disease. It's a very, very valid agenda and you need to have the confidence in that, that it, it, that it works. Givers give, givers give. If they don't wanna give, they're not going to. That's just it, they're just not going to. But it's not about you. It could be that it's not the right, as we, as, as we said earlier, it could be it's not the right time for them. Um, I told a story when we were doing prep. My best friend has been my best friend for 50 years. How lucky am I, right? Um, when I was taking her to an event at LLS, and she'd never given to me, never given a dime to me, not for anything I've ever done, never. never. So I was at a, going to an event in LLS in Detroit, and I asked her if she wanted to come with me because, you know, well, we just wanted her to come. We're dry. She picked me up at my hotel, and we're driving to the event. And um, I said, I'm just so glad you're coming. She said, yeah, I know. I just need to get involved. And I said, well, I, you know, you can do what you need to do. And she said, yeah. She said, well, my dad died from lymphoma. Excuse me? I'm sorry, best friend, 50 years at the funeral. And I did not know that. I, there were other causes, of course. But at the end of the day, it was, it was a lymphoma. She never told me that. She never told me that. She wasn't ready. She wasn't ready, and she gave a significant gift that night. Um, sometimes it just works that way. Giving is actually good for your health. When you support your community, you're going to feel better, and it's going to be a healthier and happier place to be. Being asked is being welcomed into someone's life. So just, just keep that in mind. Whenever you're thinking, I don't know if I can ask that person. I don't know. When you ask somebody like that, you are inviting them into your life. You're making them a part of who you are and who your family is. And so you should never feel hesitant about doing that. You just, you just shouldn't. You know, people know that they're gonna be asked about 85% of the time. It's usually not a big surprise. You know, by the time you get to the point where you're actually making an ask, they know it's coming. So just kind of key, the actual asking, especially of big gifts, takes up no more than about 15% of the time because you've already done the work in advance. You've already talked to them. They already know about the mission and, and frankly, they know why you're there. So just keep that in mind. That can take the fears down as well. Rehearse. Rehearse asking. If you're making a face-to-face -face ask, rehearse. Rehearse it with your, with your spouse. Rehearse it with your people at work. Just rehearse it, and, and it'll come more easier. Again, know who you're talking to and know what your story is about. And finally, aim on talking 20 to 25% of the time and listening for the rest. We want to find out about them. Now, first, yeah, you're going to have your story. That's right. That's part of that. But then as you're engaging and you're talking with them, ask them questions. Why do you think you would want to support this? Have you known anybody that's dealing with NF before? Have you known anybody that's dealing with a rare disease before? Have you known anybody that is struggling? And, and what has it meant to you? So to get them to start talking so they can begin to relate to what you're asking. And... That's about it. Does anybody have any questions? Okay, I think I stayed pretty close, right? Within one minute, that was pretty good. So I thank you so much. <laughs>